Welcome to Vineyard Boise. It's our vision to make the invisible God visible wherever He places us. We come together on Sundays to worship and fellowship corporately, but we know that church isn't just about Sunday. It's about a lifelong day-to-day -day following of Christ with other believers. We invite you to join us just as you are. If you'd like to support our ministry, visit vineyardboise.org and click the Give Online button. As I mentioned, Patricia Bootsma has been here this weekend for a seminar, and she agreed to stay over and bless us on Sunday morning as well. So would you welcome, with great anticipation, Patricia Bootsma. Oh, thank you. It must be Leah. Is that Leah? Oh. It's not even Leah. Oh, my goodness. Thank you, Pastor Trevor. By the way, I just want to say this is very brave because he never had heard me speak. I had never met him until Friday. So let's give it up for him giving up his pulpit. That's uh, a pretty brave thing to do. So may you not regret it. But anyways, <laughs> come Holy Spirit. Wow. You know, how about let's just do this little exercise. Hold out our hands for a moment, just like we're expecting a gift. Lord, let your glory fall. The Hebrew word kabod, mean the weightiness of your presence. Who, Lord, we're asking for transformation. We're asking for that which changes us from glory to glory. And Lord, we thank you for nice meetings because they're nice. But Lord, we want more than that. We want impact, God, lasting fruit. Who? Come in your presence. Come in your glory. Let your fire fall. Thank you, Holy Spirit. You're so faithful. <laughs> Lord, let your anointing come in the name of Jesus. Whoa. Yeah, keep coming. You know, I just want to declare what I'm hearing right now. I feel people that are struggling with addictions this morning. The Lord is saying you're going to get set free. If you want to be free, you will be free. I, I just feel we're supposed to pray for that after. Father, I thank you that you're bigger than any addiction. You're bigger than any demon. Father, you're bigger than anything we've been struggling with. I just see the Lord saying hope today. Hope for that freedom. Hope for that breakthrough because God is bigger. I love what Corey Ten Boom used to say. There is no pit so deep that God is not deeper still. So come in your glory. Come in your fire. You know, on Friday, it was awesome to see people healed in their back and neck. And I just see the Lord, again, touching neck problems. Lord, healing in neck issues, stiffness in the neck. Father, healing through the power of the blood of Jesus. Whoa. Father, let your spirit flow all over this place, Lord. We love you. We need you. We want you. Ho, oh, keep coming. Yes, Lord, more, more. More of your presence, more of your glory. Lord, I bless the touching of families and marriages. And yeah, do what you love to do. Yeah, thank you, Father. Yeah, more of you, more of you. We love you, Jesus. Well, Thank you again for having me. You know, I was, uh, I'm a Canadian. I was raised on a Canadian farm. I milked cows growing up. Any other cow people here, farmers? I see one right in the front. Thank you. Trained horses. And I don't know, what am I doing in Boise, Idaho? I don't know. All I say, <laughs> somewhere along the line, the Lord had, uh, you know, said, will you say yes? And I said yes. And so I just, I, I bless everybody here today. You know, Psalm 139 says it clearly that we have a, a destiny that in verse 16, it talks about this book in heaven that is written about our lives, that he has a plan and a purpose. So uh, just today, I just feel like we, can we just say yes? Start it off that way. Yes. <laughs> yes, Lord. Yes, yes, yes. Yes to your plan and yes to your purpose. You know, I believe the Lord is coming with extraordinary revival and a move of the glory that we've never seen on planet Earth thus far. 
Um, he was uh, Bob Jones, who prophesied many years ago. He's since gone on to heaven. He's a, a hillbilly prophet, was a hillbilly prophet. But he said 2020 is a year when there's going to be a great increase of the number of souls being saved coming into the kingdom onto this great harvest of souls, which would be even a billion soul harvest. And I believe that. I believe that there's a setting up right now onto the more that God wants to do. Bobby Connor prophesied back in uh, last November about 2019, and he said it was going to be a year starting off like a year of tears, that there was going to be a lot of tears. And then those tears would be turned into tears of joy and tears as we see Nahum 1-7 lived out that God is good. And that's certainly been the experience of my life, transitioning from Canada to America. But it was started back 16, 17 months ago ago when we were driving, my daughter, my youngest daughter and I were driving uh, across the border from Fort Erie, from coming from Toronto to Washington, coming across the Fort Erie into Buffalo uh, border, which is a big bridge across the Niagara River. And as I'm on the bridge, six o'clock in the morning, the Holy Spirit speaks. It's like this inner audible voice, super clear. And he said, I am coming with revival in America. And all of the... Um and all of the hoopla, like all of these, there's natural disasters, the hurricanes, the floods, the fires, the disunity, the political upheaval, all of that stuff. The enemy is raging about what I'm about to do in America. And I was so taken off guard. I was not expecting that. I was not, you know, thinking and, and certainly never thought that 16 months later or seven, whatever it is now, I, I, that I'd actually be in America as our role has just been transitioned from Canada to North America. So we're, uh, I don't have a house yet, but we're basing out of Raleigh, North Carolina. And I just want to say, I believe it. I believe that God is going to do what he said he's going to do. But here is the deal. This whole thing of revival, what is it? By the way, if you look it up, it talks about a spirit, uh, uh, a revival is like a time of great um, renewal in the life of a church. But I'd like to extend that to say that it also is extended into outside the walls of the church. And by the way, it's also onto Reformation, which is where we see societal change, where we see change in the society around us. How many of you know that when Jesus uh, did his ministry, miracles on earth, there was about 40 recorded miracles on that Jesus performed, 40 recorded, and only two of them were actually in the temple or in the sanctuary of the church, that I believe that God is coming with a mighty move of the Spirit that's also outside the walls of the church. Can, yeah, thank you. I had one amen. One guy's excited. <laughs> <laughs> my, my friend Stacy Campbell likes to say it this way. It's, it's going to be also a revival of nine to five out there in the schools and in the businesses and in the marketplace and on the streets and just incredible signs and wonders. You know, one time I was, uh, I, I led the Canadian Prophetic Council for a period of time, but I was in one of our Canadian Prophetic Council meetings and, and Pat, uh, Patricia King spoke and she was talking about prophetic evangelism. And I don't know what happened to me, but I just got hit by the spirit and I started weeping uncontrollably there's this lady beside me I bless her heart she kept feeding me Kleenexes and I started to lean on her I didn't even know who she is but I was just weeping for souls and you know what? I had thought for years, oh, well, my, my contribution in the body of Christ is, oh, I'll be a prophetic voice, or, you know, we pastored for 25 years now. And, but the Lord convicted me that day. He said, if you're a Christian, you're a soul winner. Whoa. And so I remember, you know, getting back um, to where I lived at that time back in Ontario. And I'm like, okay, you know, how many of you know that if God speaks to you something, sometimes you got to act on it right away or you'll talk yourself out of it. Anybody else that way? <laughs> you'll talk yourself out of it. So I grabbed this girl who I knew would be game for anything and said, hey, we're going to the mall. She's like, okay. We go to the mall and we're in the food court. And I'm like, okay, God, here I am. And he said, well, you see that red, that lady over there with red hair? Go up to her and tell her that I love her. And I'm like, okay, this is easy, but I'm like nervous, you know. I'm like, hi, um, I'm a Christian. I believe God speaks. And by the way, he just told me to tell you that he loves you. Do you want to know something? That lady got saved that day. That lady's sister got saved. That lady's kids all got saved later. And that lady's sister's kids all got saved. And they all joined our church. Oh, my goodness. You know what? That was the mercy of God giving me a quick win, all right? <laughs> 
But we've seen so many people saved outside the walls of the church, not just prophetic evangelism, but I believe God wants to visit businesses and marketplace. How many of you know the story of Hobby Lobby? Can I just say this right now? I love Hobby Lobby. We didn't have it in Canada. It was so deprived. But now I'm in America. I can go to Hobby Lobby. Do you know that it, Hobby Lobby's founder, his name is David Green. David Green was one of, of six kids, seven kids actually, uh, in a family of a pastor, just small churches. They weren't very wealthy. They, they had very little money. But you know what? His parents just ingrained the spirit of, of, of the love of the word of God and the love for God. And every one of his siblings went into pulpit ministry or missionaries. He, however, had an inkling for business. And so he worked in these five and dime stores and, and uh, he kept being promoted. And one time he called his mom. He said, mom, I'm the, I'm the youngest manager of a certain level in business in all of America. And she said, you know, that's very nice, son, but when are you going to do something for the Lord? Do you want to know something? Hobby Lobby, which he went on to found in his garage with his wife, right now affects one third of the world's population. What? There are over 50% of their income is given to missions or the translation of the Bible to solar Bibles, chip Bibles, the Bible app. You got the Bible app? That's paid for by Hobby Lobby or the um, Bible Museum in Washington, D.C. Or extraordinary billions of dollars have been given for, by that company for the furthering of the gospel. Do you think that's ministry? Come on, church. I think we need to expand our ability to believe of what kind of revival God is going to send. By the way, and I've been part of, of the Toronto, you know, the move of the Spirit in Toronto. I'm a Johnny Carroll Arnett founding pastor. my spiritual parents. I've known them since I was 10 years old. And we had 12 years of nightly meetings except for Monday night. Think about that. 12 years nightly meetings and raising six kids in the midst of it, by the way. And I remember my husband received a note from one of our kids one time. It was misspelled. It said, Dad, I want you to come home. And that was a good message to pull back, you know, and all that we were doing to, uh, you know, instill into our children. So I know about that, but I also believe that you can't package God. I don't think God is necessarily going to do the same thing the same way. I think he's coming with a worldwide revival that's going to affect the entire planet that is also outside and inside the walls of the church. Get ready. Get ready. Now, I just, you know, the hotbed for revival right now is Iran. Did you know that per capita, Iran has the most number of souls coming in? And it is a mostly young people, 70% of them in Iran, 70% of Iranians are, are um, young people under the age of 30. One of the greatest privileges I had in speaking is, is in Turkey. I was speaking in Turkey to Iranian believers who were there. Everything had to be in secret. We were in this mountainous location beyond the big gate. I couldn't know their names. We couldn't take pictures. And it was because some of them, like they had been in Evan prison, if you know the notorious prison that they were tortured in. The stories were crazy. They said, yes, this is a picture of my mother. She was taken into the forest and she was shot dead. This is uh, my wife and I. We were in Evan prison. She was uh, raped. We were beaten. We were uh, told to give up the names of all of our contacts in the underground church. You know, and it was just an incredible time. And they hung on every word. I've never spoken somewhere that they were that hungry. Come on, are you hungry in Boise? I hope so. But I never forget this. They, some of them, they lost everything. Many of them lost their homes. They lost their jobs. They lost their families. They lost, and they said this, we never knew Jesus was all we needed until he was all we had left. Iran is the hotbed for revival right now. You know, sometimes what works contrary to revival is just too much abundance. And it's like, I'm not saying that, like, Lord, Lord bring it on, but I am saying, God, I want to be desperate and hungry for you, even in abundance. Even when we are blessed here in America and Canada, it's like, this is the thing, voluntary love, voluntary fire in our hearts. I love what John Wesley said when he said, you know, I just want to set myself on 
fire and let them watch me burn. Because I can't imagine trying to help people know Jesus and say something like, come and be dead and bored and dull like me. Does it work that way? I don't think so. But there is a world that desperately need him and need us to burn for him. You know, it's not just like, you know, I don't know. It's not just like fake it. But I am saying that there's a daily walk. There's a daily walk with God. I'm 53 years old. I knew Jesus uh, when I was 12. I was born again. I rededicated my life to Jesus when I was around 18, 19. I had a few years of stupidity on me. I'm sure that doesn't happen in America. But but I did. And I needed to return to Jesus and really give him everything. Somebody told me this years ago, they said, if you knew all the facts, you'd always choose God's way. If you knew all the facts of what's going to happen to you in 20 years and 10 years and 30 years, whatever, you'd always choose God's way. And somewhere along there, I said, you know what? I'm going to choose God's way. And choosing God's way is so much more glorious, so much more extraordinary than I could ever imagine. And that is where he's bringing us. God's way, I believe, is this the way he didn't promise you a rose garden. He did promise you the garden of Gethsemane, which is not my will, but your will be done, O oh God. And it's like, God, I just want you. And what does this look like? Because we are headed for this extraordinary move of the Spirit. I really believe it. I believe that the Lord is, is saying that something is coming that's so great. And it's for all of us. It's not just for those in pulpit ministry. As much as I love pulpit ministry, I've been in pulpit ministry. I used to be a, a registered nurse, and I saw tons of people got saved there too. But guess what? Most of the fish are out there. That's where they are. Listen to what Bill Johnson said. I think I like this quote. I grew up in a time when it was typically thought that anyone who really loved God passionately should be a pastor, missionary, evangelist. It was not even questioned. If someone had an unusual passion for God, it was normal to send them to a foreign land to serve. I'm sure there were some cases where that was the right thing to do. It's the underlying concept that I have a problem with. That approach means we automatically remove our most influential and passionate people from our community life. Passion breeds passion. By sending them far away, we remove the leaven of passion from our business community, from our educational system, from the rest of our culture. How tragic and completely unnecessary. But with the idea that everyone is a minister, God was going after our ideas about the secular and the sacred. The notion that ministry is sacred, that work outside the church is secular, would have to change. The lines we've always drawn between the two would have to be erased. The significance of the call is not found in the assignment, it's found in the one who called us. And that gets into who is this one who called us. In the beginning of this year, the Lord spoke to me and said, Patricia, this year of 2019, I want you to learn to love me more than you've ever loved me before. I want you to know Jesus Christ. I want you to seek him out and search him out. And I was like, whoa, what? Like, I've been a Christian for 40 years. But I do know that there is more to know about the beauty of this one who's called us and who's loved us, who's died for us and who's coming again. That there was much more that I needed to go after. And I suspect that's the same for every one of us. And if there's anything I'd love to see accomplished, so to speak, from this time here, it's just like, oh God, may every one of us love you more than we've ever loved you before. May there be something that's written on our hearts. May there be something that we decide. Like David said, I set my heart to love you. I set my heart to seek you. Because this move of the Spirit is everything having to do about Him. Because the world is searching and longing and needing something to fill that void and it is about Jesus Christ and the Father and the Father heart revelation. I, I, I love it because I've been so immersed in it and I needed healing. I didn't have a great relationship with my earthly dad. I needed the, the revelation, hallelujah, for the revelation of the Father heart of God. Hallelujah for the infilling of the Holy Spirit. By the way, you don't have a revival without the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit. But guess what? The Father in a wedding walks the bride down the aisle. There's something the Father's saying, my son, I'm preparing a bride for my son. 
I had it one night where I was awakened at, at in the middle of the night, and it was like seriously felt like an earthquake. We don't normally get them in Canada. And it was just, and the whole house was shaking. I felt it shaking. By the way, that like my husband basically doesn't wake up for anything. If the babies were crying, it was his turn. I have to give him a kick, you know? So anyways, I, I, I was just awakened. I looked at the clock, and it was 2.22. And I was like, man, what was that? That wow, was wild. Like I, that, that was real. And then all of a sudden it started again. And I looked at the clock and it was 2.25. And I heard the Lord say, Matthew 22, verse 2, and Matthew 22, verse 5. And I'm like, okay, this is worth waking up for, you know? So I opened my Bible, and what does it say in verse 2? It says, in essence, it says the king is made a wedding feast. He's preparing a wedding feast for his son. But verse 5 says, but they made light of it, and they just went their way, and they did their own thing. Come on, church, there's a wedding to come. There is a wedding to come. There's a bridegroom who loves you and who loves me. It's not ethereal. It is not, I don't even think it's that, that far off. I believe that as we live ready, I want to tell you another story. Now you can call this what you will, a vision or, or whatever. I, I wondered if it was like a third heaven encounter. I realize it don't happen that often, but it is in the Bible, Second Corinthians 12. But one time I'm worshiping the Lord. I'm seeking God when all of a sudden my spirit is in heaven. And I saw all these people, and I immediately knew who they were. My mother's maiden name is Corvairs, and even though my parents were raised in Holland, that is a French name. It's because her ancestors came from France. They're the Huguenots. If you know anything about history, the Huguenots were very devout Christians, very prophetic, but they had to flee France in the Inquisition. 20,000 of them were slaughtered in one day. My ancestors fled from France on her side to Holland. And all this, I just saw all these people, and I knew they were my family tree. I just knew it. And I saw my grandmother, who, by the way, I had known on earth. She had been dead for 10 years or so, and I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm not dead yet. This is really weird. Why am I seeing this? Ah, what's happening to me? When all of a sudden I heard this dialogue, and they said, you are Patricia. Our race is over, and our time is done. We're cheering you on. That gave me a whole new view of the great cloud of witnesses, by the way. And they said, we're cheering you on. Tell them of this place and tell them he's worth it all. 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 Uh, it's hard to, you know, say what that did to me. I came out of that experience just so undone. I was weeping and I just said, God, every day that I live, every breath that I breathe, every time left on this planet that you give me, I want to proclaim the truth that you are worth it all. You are worth it when we make decisions to love you and to seek you. You are worth it when we bypass every distraction or every temptation of sin. You are worth it when we and so into others that love is the greatest, that the great commandment really should be the greatest thing we ever pursue, to love you. God, I'm asking for the anointing for that. Church, he's worth it all. He's beautiful. As David said in Psalm 27, one thing I seek, one thing I desire, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and inquire in his temple. And so this year, this has been my pursuit. Lord, reveal Jesus to me. Reveal his beauty, just like you did in the road to Emmaus, Luke 24, when these guys, these two disciples, Jesus had died on the cross. They're so confused, and all of a sudden he appears to them. And what does he do? He opens their eyes to the scriptures that they would see him. He opens the eyes. By the way, do you know how many people Jesus appeared to when he had been resurrected, but before he ascended? Does anybody know how many people? 500. How many showed up in the upper room to pray? 120. What happened to the 380? I don't know. But the 120 showed up. The 120 cried out as he said, wait, Terry, pray. I'm bringing the Holy Spirit to come. I want to be one of the 120, that's for sure. God, 
we're asking this, this beauty of Jesus. So even, as, I don't know, like it says, I'm not a theologian. I love the Bible. I was sharing this weekend that I smuggled Bibles into China many years ago. And I was just Jackie Pullinger, Bibles everywhere. I was discovered at the border and, you know, they're having it out. And anyways, when one border guard went back into the back, the other bar border guard put my Bibles back in my bag and said, get out of here. So I'm like, okay, great. We got 500 Bibles through that day. And we're acting like tourists, staying in nice hotels. The Bibles were delivered underground at secret, in secret at night to the underground church in China. And that was many years ago. I think I'm about 19 years old. And I remember thinking, how many Bibles do I have at home? Five? They're collecting dust. These guys are, are risking their lives to get these Bibles that we have smuggled into here. Why am I not reading the Bible? Ever since that time, I've sought to be a woman of the word. I love the Bible. I really do. I love Jesus. I tell you, the word of God, come on church, get it off the shelf. Teach your children to love the word. There's this, as Hebrews 4 said, this is a, a sword. It divides soul and spirit. So the word of God, we see how Jesus is threaded through everything from the garden of Eden, from the creation of the world, from the crushing, the, the, the uh, seed of the woman that would crush the head of the serpent, 300 or more prophecies in the Old Testament about his coming, riding on a donkey in, 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 in Zechariah, being born in Bethlehem, in Micah, to Isaiah, you know, the, that he would be the suffering servant, on and on and on. This is the beautiful one woven throughout the scriptures. He is the same one who's coming again. He is the offspring of David. He is the bright morning star. He's the alpha. He's the omega. He's the beginning. He's the end. He's Emmanuel. He's Savior, Judge, King of Kings, and Lord of Lords. He is brighter than any uh, morning star. He's beautiful. Ah. If you think I'm crazy, I don't really care. Because I'm lovesick. I'm lovesick. Because he is so worth it all. He's so worth it all. And I tell you, this world, sitting in Starbucks just recently, ah, and, you know, there's this guy, I'm trying to focus on a conversation with this lovely lady that wanted to meet with me, and all I can think about is this guy behind her who's sitting there looking dejected. And finally I said, hey, do you mind if we just go talk to this guy? So we talked to this guy, hey, you know, I'm a Christian. I believe God's real. Blah, blah, tell him the gospel. You know what that guy says? I want to know Jesus. That's what he said. And then you know when a guy who heard our conversation said, he said, I want to know Jesus too. Come on, church. The fish are jumping in the boat. I had this time, another time besides the one in the, I was in Iceland at a, and we were with these, all these leaders and we were at this million dollar house on the lake for a large dinner party, 21 people, 21 people, nice dinner party. Somebody shows me a picture of this guy in Niger who had heard that the true God was the God of the West. He's a nomadic leader who decided that if the true God is the God of the West, that he should start walking West. He started walking West with all of his family, this nomadic leader. He walked 2,000 miles. And all he met was those of his own religion. And then he turned around, dejected, and he walked, started to walk back when he met my friend, Terrier, from Norway who is an amazing, it's like called the Indiana Jones of the Christian world. But there's Terrier and told him about Jesus. This nomadic leader not only got saved, but he's led 500 other leaders, other people to the Lord. He has his own church and it's in Niger. But there was something about that story that got me. All of a sudden I began to weep because of the fact that somebody had to walk 2,000 miles to try to find the true God. 
And I was just undone and, and, and this dinner party and they didn't know what to do with me because you know, I'm crying for souls. And, and then I just kind of slip underneath the table and I'm snotting. You know, they showed me recently the carpet stain that my snot is still there. <laughs> was there recently and it was like you know one and then you know what they did they just went on with dessert that's what they did they went on with dessert and I looked like an idiot but I do know this that after that encounter and a few others have come out of it saying I'm gonna burn for Jesus and I've seen so many come on you know what compassion Jesus was moved with compassion and he said, the harvest is ripe, the labors are few. And then what did he say? Did he actually say, get out there? You know what the first thing he said? Therefore, now pray. Pray the Lord of the harvest to send out labors into the harvest. And that's another story I want to tell you. Revival is coming. Jesus is worth it all. And how do we get there? I believe we need to pray. When we moved from Toronto to a, my hometown, Stratford, asked to help this church, the mother church, that had not been doing very well in a city known for drug problems, in a city with Freemasonry symbols, uh, streets formed in the Freemasonry symbol. And I thought, oh my goodness, I'm too young to be put out to pasture. Oh God, why did you send me back? And it was like he was saying, Patricia, do not, I do not send you out to war to lose. I send you out to war to win. And by the way, there's a rich revival history in that city. And it was like this desperate cry that my husband had had. How do we redig wells? How do we get revival? How do we see the spirit move? And the Lord said, pray, worship me and declare I'm Lord of the city. And we thought, you know, we think we can do that. Okay. So we just began to pray every weekday morning, gave our mornings to the Lord, prayed, worshiped. Now, I'm not saying that everybody has to do this. Not everybody's a full-time, you know, and you don't, you, some of you got to go to work. But here's the point. We started to pray, and then we took it to the church. Other people started to join. We extended our hours. In the meantime, he sends his little praying mantis to my door to teach me how to pray. I'm like, I get it, God. I get it. And then as we're doing this, guess Guess what? First sign that something was shifting, prodigal sons and daughters came to Jesus. They got rid of their sex addictions and their drug addictions and their pornography addictions and were like, praise God, something's happening. Hallelujah. And then it went on from there. Drug houses. I'm not kidding. They started to blow up. They started to get discovered by police. The big hotel across from the YMCA that was known for seedy drug deals, it burned to the ground one day. We thought this is probably not a bad idea. And then the top drug dealer in the city of Stratford, he'd been dealing drugs to the high school. He came to our church one day. He was a 33 degree Mason. We were shocked to see him. He started crying out of the presence of God. He went to the bathroom to get himself together. He came out and he got saved that day. And that took out the drug supply to the high school. My husband was asked by the mayor of Stratford to start a mayor's prayer breakfast, which he did and then still goes on to today. 300 of the city's top business leaders, church leaders, and political leaders come to the mayor's prayer breakfast. It went on and on. For, tw for a period of time, we were 24-7 in a downtown storefront facility that the city of Stratford, the city council paid, gave us money to pray. Is that unbelievable or what? Every life-giving church began to boom and grow. And then they said, our leaders said, come back to Toronto. We want you to start the House of Prayer in Toronto. This is 2011. We want you to, um, we want you to pastor, but to start the House of Prayer, which we did. And that church just, even to this day, it's, it's, oh, I'm not saying how great are we. I'm saying there is something to this. When David went after the Ark of the Covenant, anybody remember that? He becomes king of all of Israel. He brings the Ark in. He pitches a tent. He sets up a worship and prayer center. It's called the Tabernacle of David. It went on for about 40 years, 24-7. It happens to coincide with Israel's greatest boundaries in history, greatest time of blessing. And what does the Bible say in Amos 9-11, repeated in Acts 15? It says, in the last days, I will rebuild the Tabernacle of David. Is it a tent? No. But it is this, the spirit and the values and the principles of we need God. And it's time to pray. And it's time to worship. And it's time to declare that Jesus Christ is Lord of Boise, Idaho. That Jesus Christ is Lord of America. That Jesus Christ is Lord of this nation that was founded on godly principles. And guess what? 
It's you and I. If my people called by my name will humble themselves and pray, I will hear from heaven and forgive their sins and heal their land. That's you. That's me. God's people. God's people. And people, I believe that the church needs to unify. Unify like never, never before. I'll just tell you a quick story. I was in, I was in Tarkistad. I'm sure you've never heard of that. Tarkistad, South Africa. And I'm, you know, brought in, flown in. Uh, it was, all I can remember is like brown desert. it had been three-year drought. It was like tumbleweed blowing in the wind. And, um, you know, I, I'm speaking at this meeting. And they, they showed up because I'm a woman from Canada. And they were all like wondering what the heck is going on. So... I didn't know anything. And all I felt is the Lord said, speak on 2 Chronicles 7, 14, which I just quoted. And then he said, open up the mic. And I'm like, no, God, that's really dangerous. He said, open up the mic. I said, okay. Some big South African man gets up and he says, I want to just ask everyone, the black people in this room, I'm asking for forgiveness for apartheid. I'm asking for forgiveness for disunity. And somebody, one of them, one of the, 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 the black people, somebody got up and said, I repent as well. And there was tears. Somebody gets up and repents for denominational disunity. I found out that they had never been in a meeting together because these churches were fighting with each other. But they came because there was some guest speaker. So they start to repent for each other, to each other. And then somebody gets up and repents for denominate or generational disunity where the younger didn't honor the older, where the older didn't honor the younger. And then I hear the whisper of the Lord. He said, now call forth the rain. I'm like, oh God, you've got to be kidding. Like, like Elijah wannabe moment, you know? I was like, oh, okay, if it's really you. In the name of Jesus, I call forth the rain. Lord, let it rain. <laughs> and at that moment, it started to rain. And we all walk outside. And it's raining. Of course, I'm going to tell you the glorious stories, right? But it's, it's raining. And then it rained for three days. It hadn't rained in six months, and it was a three-year drought. It rained so intensely, and they showed me pictures later that what was brown and what was supposed to be a lake, now it became a lake. What was brown became green. And God just moved, and the house of prayer started in that community. I'm telling you something. There's something about us getting together. I can't do this prayer thing all by myself. Neither can you. You can in your closet. There's two different forms. I'm talking about the corporate. I'm talking about corporate causes corporate results. I'm talking about the fact that there's something that the Lord is breathing. I believe that Boise, Idaho, why am I here? All I can say is I've never been here before, but I feel this brewing in the spirit. I feel this brewing in the spirit. I feel like the Lord is saying that I am trying to stir wells of revival here. I feel like the Lord is saying that he's sending people in. I'm so shocked by people I've been talking to. Say, yeah, I just moved to Boise. I don't know why God told me to move to Boise. That's a good sign for you guys. That's a good sign. And I also think it's significant that you just had a 30 year anniversary of this church. Because 30 years is always a sign of there's a transition. There's a Jesus was 30 when he began his ministry. I've saw it in my own life that when I was 30, all of a sudden, things took off. Come on, church, something's about to take off. If my people call by my name, humble themselves and pray, hear from heaven, forgive their sins, heal their land, ho, 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 ho. Who was it who brought the Ark of the Covenant First from Kiriat Jerim, then from Obed Edom's house to Jerusalem. What was the right way of transporting the ark? On the shoulders of the priests. And who are today's priests? Kings and priests, Revelation 1 6. Church of the firstborn, Hebrews 12. It's you and me that help bring in the glory. Does that sound audacious? No. You know what? There's something about God saying, you can't do my part and I won't do your part. There's a partnership here with heaven on earth as it is in heaven. Oh God, let it be. Let's all stand. Can I have the worship team come back up?
Come Holy Spirit. By the way, there's another book back there about prophecy, prayer, and the power of God's word. Come Holy Spirit. Asking for the fire of your glory to come, Lord. Jesus. Take your rightful place. Take your rightful place in Boise, Idaho. Take your rightful place in our hearts and our lives. Take your rightful place in our families, even in our businesses, our job. Jesus, come. You know, the same root word for work is worship. It's avadah. Avadah, work, worship. Lord, in our work, let it be as worship to you. When we go into our job, let the glory of God go into our jobs, God. Forgive us for irritation of coworkers. Forgive us for just doing it for a paycheck. God, we want to do what we do for the glory of God. Break in, Holy Spirit, into these schools that are just starting. Raise up students that start prayer meetings, 12-year-olds on fire for Jesus. <laughs> Come, oh God, in businesses. Raise up many more Hobby Lobbies, God. Chick-fil-A's. <laughs> Come on, oh God, will you let your fire fall upon every person here? The call, the destiny, the plan that you have. <laughs> Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. 